for recording. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar today. And um, this is kind of going to be the way we're going to go here for a while <clears throat> with this whole uh, pandemic going on. Obviously, um, it's all over the news. It's kind of hard to miss. So, uh, but you know, we're just going to try these webinars. See how you guys like these. Um, at the end, we may ask you a few questions to think about. Uh, one thing is, you know, with these uh, solar webinars, we would like to possibly start maybe two a week here in about another week and a half. Uh, so just ponder that question and, and let us know if that's something that uh, you would be willing to attend or if you would prefer that we stick to uh, one per week. So just a little, little thought before we get started. So uh, while we get started, my name is uh, John Pendleton. And uh, hang on one second, for some reason it's not. There we go, there we go. Uh, this is me, John Pendleton. I'm normally the trainer. We have a couple other trainers as well, uh, but I'm the senior trainer here at Intertech. I've been with Intertech for about seven years and I also work back in tech support. So if you've called in to tech support, had any warranty issues, you may have talked to me, or if you've gone to any of the geothermal university uh, classes, it was more than likely me. So uh, also we have some uh, geothermal trainings coming up as well on our website. Uh, there are, again, they're gonna be webinars. So feel free to check out you know, weekly our different trainings that are coming up because we're always adding more trainings. If you need to get a hold of me, here's my contact information. Uh, email is probably the best because I do work out of the office quite a bit. Uh, so email is usually the best way to get a hold of me. Then we've got Kyle Smith. He's sitting next to me today. Uh, he's our solar sales and energy storage manager. Uh, he's basically our solar guru right now. Um, we're all learning it as well as you guys are. Uh, you know, the new technologies and things. And uh, so Kyle's got a pretty good handle on that. If you ever need any assistance through Kyle, uh, email is probably the best way to get a hold of him as well, because he does travel out to site visits and help on some installs and that kind of thing. Uh, so he's out of the office quite a bit as well. We've got our design team. Uh, we offer design services here at Intertech for the solar as well as geo. And we've got Angelique Wood, Jeremy Vonderhaar, and our newest ad addition, uh, Jim Cusack. Jim also helps out with the uh, other trainings as well. Um, I'm sure he'll get involved with these, putting on some of these solar trainings. He's up in Minnesota. Uh, he was the uh, sales manager for Minnesota for a long time. And uh, he's kind of wore quite a few hats. So uh, we're trying to let him take a few of those hats off. So he's gonna be handling some of the design uh, and help out in tech support. So we're glad to have Jim aboard. He's always helped us out in training and he's done a great job. So uh, we're glad to have him with us. Um, so design, if you need help with design, there's forms and things, and we'll go over that today uh, as we cover the sales and marketing process. But you can always call into design services as a direct line there, as well as an email. Uh, we also offer, uh, we have sales, our sales team, which is for solar. Uh, we have inside sales as well as, um, you know, Kyle and his team, obviously training. Uh, we do have marketing available for you, uh, logistics. If you ever need to get a hold of customer service, check on an order or anything, you can always call the uh, eight six or excuse me six one eight six six four ninety ten. That will always take you, take you to the front desk, uh, but you can al always call them direct at this six six four ninety eleven if you need to speak with uh, customer service. We also forgot Zach Slatten on the slide. I I made this slide and forgot, but uh, Zach Slatten is also our uh, solar technical sales expert as well as install trainer. And uh, Zach uh, goes out to job sites and, and works with customers, our Intertex customers, on uh, complicated projects and uh, getting started on their first job. So we'll come out and help you on your first solar job as well um, to get started. So. That's Zach Slatten, and we'll uh, provide you his contact information as well in the follow-up email. 
We also have one other person that really helps out quite a bit. Um, she's probably on here today as well, but uh, Carly Fletcher, she helps me out organizing these trainings. She helps Kyle out, uh, you know, getting some stuff ready as well. And she works back in marketing and she's been a great asset to me, uh, helping me get some of these webinars uh, where we need to be. So um, you guys may hear from her from time to time uh, on some of the training stuff. So uh, some of the services we offer, obviously we sell residential and commercial equipment, uh, geothermal as well as solar. We do have job site delivery available. Obviously there's a certain range um, and I don't know, Kyle, is there a fee for that delivery? Uh, not, not at this point. Um, it's um, it depends on complexity, but uh, you know, our main warehouse is in Greenville, Illinois. Uh, we're going to be ramping up our Mitchell location with solar products in the future, but right now we're shipping out of Illinois and can do transfers to Mitchell. Uh, and I'm saying that because uh, of a radius out of Illinois, so we can we can make it within about four uh, four hours, I would say, or, or more um for job site delivery at this point can we get a, a mic check real quick uh jim or carly i'm gonna uh, yeah let me see here yep i'm on here hello everyone okay. we just want to make make sure you can hear us still okay all good. Uh, we do offer some SREC services, which is uh, the what that's like the utilities. Yeah. So the S Direct program uh, for particularly Illinois at this point, there was a program in Ohio. There's uh, one in Maryland at one time. New Jersey has one currently. Uh, right now in Illinois, we are an approved vendor for the S Direct program. So uh, we have those services available um as well and that's just um i'll simply say that that's a, a lot of paperwork that we handle in-house so then we can also do roof mounts ground mounts as we talked about with zach we offer installation support uh training you on your first few projects to help get you going training obviously that's what we're doing today we want to make sure that you're well equipped to sell uh, design and install and you're ready to go off and running uh, and last, we offer design services, and those design services, we, we love to do it ourselves um, because we want to be able to help you, help you feel comfortable uh, with your projects and show you how to do it, uh, install it the best way possible. Um, you know, with solar, I think that if, as long as you pretty well throw some panels up on a roof, it'll work. But what we find is it's craftsmanship and uh, making sure that we follow to the proper codes um is where we can really help the most and have a nice price point uh with our designs as well so on our website uh intertechusa.com if you click on uh on the professionals tab next to this, uh, support and secure. And if you go to our website, let me back up just a little bit. If you go to our website, you can uh, register and you can set up a password and then you can get into the support and secure site. Uh, when you do that, just know that we're not gonna sell your information or any, anything like that. So we will send you emails, but it's not like we send junk emails out all the time. We'll send you emails on upcoming trainings or uh, new products that are coming out or any kind of meetings or anything that we have. So uh, feel free to go ahead and register there. But if you go to our main page and you wanna get to some of the solar design stuff, uh, information, click on the professionals tab on the main screen, and then it will take you to this screen here. Go ahead and click on design services. It will then take you uh, to another screen. This is more towards the bottom of that next screen, but you can click on a geothermal design form or a solar design form. So this is where you're gonna start if you want to request a design that Intertech will create for you. You've gotta fill out this form first. You can't just call in to Intertech and say, hey, I need a 10K ground mount system. You've gotta go ahead and design. There's a lot of questions we're gonna ask 
And you'll see as we go through this training today, you know, what we're looking for. So we're just gonna kind of show you how to get to that form. So you can click on the tab there. It will bring you to this form and you can start uh, filling it out. If you do have any questions, you can call us and we'll help you fill it out. We would rather have you call in and uh, get the right information on the form, then you send the form in, it's not filled out, and then we have to contact you, and then we're playing phone tag. Uh, so if you don't know how to fill something out or you're just not really sure, definitely give us a call and we'll, we'll walk you right through it. So this is just more of the form, talking about your company name, uh, the contact, first and last name, obviously the phone number, email, address, um, and all that. If you do need to look at some, if you're here in Illinois and you wanna look at some of the incentive programs, you can click on that little tab uh, down there as well. Again, more uh, on the form, uh, there's a job name, end users, full name, email, phone number, um, don't think we're just going to call your homeowner or the homeowner for you or your customer. Uh, we won't do that. Uh, we would, if we ever needed to contact them, we would always reach out to you first. So uh, we just like to have it in our files for future reference. Make sure you obviously got the job address because uh, we're going to have to look at that for some, uh, you know, sun and shading and all that kind of thing. Some uh, bin data, if you would. Obviously, make sure you uh, mark where you would like the array to be delivered, whether that's at the company address, a job site, or uh, wherever you would like to. Last is utility information. And the, with the utility information, this is really critical. And we spoke, uh, we've been speaking a lot about it lately. Uh, depending on where you're located, uh, Midwest, West, you know, or, or the East, it, it, really matters about that utility and uh, how their solar policies apply. So we need to know who the utility is that the site is on and and then their rate um, as well. And lastly, if the site is a single phase or three phase. Most importantly, uh, a, job, a design can take a few hours to do and uh, it is not quick, especially on commercial. So knowing the exact voltage and not a guess is critical. And we'll talk more about that in, uh, in a little bit of sales, but more so in the design side. Make sure you uh, download the electrical bills or upload, I guess, uh, to your uh, uh, right here on this screen here. Uh, so we can take a look at that and that's how we basically we're going to size your system is by that make sure you obviously put new construction or retrofit and whether it's a commercial or residential on this page here you can uh, tell us you'd prefer your uh, solar array to be on a roof or a ground um, so here's where you would specify that when we do the uh, design for this, you know, it, it, that's gonna make a big difference. I mean, if you want it on the ground and you say that on the form that you want it on the roof, obviously we're gonna design it for the roof and try to fit as many panels as we can up there uh, for uh, to, to uh, complete your array. So just make sure we've got the location and if there's any obstructions or shading notes, like let's say, you know that you've got three oak trees in front of the home and it's gonna shade it the whole time. When we pull up the uh, Aurora, the program, and it shows that home, it's gonna show those trees. Well, if they're gonna remove those trees, then you need to let us know that, that they're gonna cut those trees down and they're not gonna be a problem. Uh, so it's just little things like that that we're gonna need to know uh, to help us design the system the best way possible. Another thing to you know, John, as well as, uh... The, as, as everyone knows, in more rural areas, we'll see that uh, Google Maps may not point us in the same address that we're looking to get to. Um, you know, once once communities are going to 911 addresses, it's, be, it's becoming more helpful. But uh, it's obviously very critical to know what site uh, we're looking at. And if you do want a ground mount, and if somebody's got property, we need to know where they want to put it. Um, you know. There's not shading to really want to affect the performance of the system, 
but it uh, it would be nice to know in advance, so in your sales tactics, that we have already put the the ground mount in the proper location. And I do, um, while I am rambling here, uh, I want to just point out one thing that a slide that I forgot to throw in um, at the beginning is is please uh, remember to go ahead and put your questions in as we move along here. I'll be on, uh, I'm on my laptop as well, trying to answer questions. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and dump questions into the uh, toolbar there and go to meeting control panel, as well as there is a chat function as well. So Jim, Carly, and myself, Kyle, will be able to uh, answer questions uh, as we're moving here along. So John's back to you. And also here at the bottom of this form, if it's a new construction or you got blueprints for the home or something, you can also uh, upload those files as well. Uh, so solar marketing, our target is our current customer base. Uh, we're trying to work with our dealers that we have now, uh, try to get them on board with doing some solar. Uh, obviously, solar is a uh, good market for new construction. I know uh, there's some places in Texas and I would imagine California and uh, things like states like that that are looking at almost making solar uh, that it almost has to be installed on some new construction. I know we've got a kind of a net zero housing addition in uh, Texas and they've got solar panels and geothermal and uh, so new construction it works great on. Uh, obviously we can do retrofit as well, not a big deal. Um, obviously it's gonna generate more leads for your business. And it's basically, you might wanna consider rebranding your business. It's kind of what, you know, here at Intertech, what, I mean, we're not rebranding our business, we're just expanding it. And, you know, it kind of goes back to our name. Our name is Intertech, which stands for energy and technology. So we're not, we don't wanna just focus on geothermal. We want to focus on technology and energy. You know, we're using energy from the earth uh, for our geosystems, and we're going to use the solar for uh, energy from the sun. So, you know, it's not that we're really rebranding, but we're expanding. And, you know, it's with things changing, you know, with uh, new technologies and things, it's where, you know, we need to go. Um, you know, we need to focus on more uh, technology in the energy industry so you know we're moving our business forward with the solar and you know it's something that you guys can definitely consider as well um, you know it's just gonna uh, build your business that much more absolutely so the target uh um line here whenever we're talking about your customer base we're, we're talking about the customers that you already have their trust with, whether it be your electrical customers um, that you've done installations with or generator sales or whatever it may be, heating and cooling. Um, but going going and talking to uh, those customers are who is the easy targets. And for those of you that are heating and cooling customers of ours already, or, or I'm sorry, that have sold geothermal and heat pumps as well are easy targets because these people have made good financial decisions for their homes, and they're super easy to lead to the next step. Sorry. Um, I can talk for a minute if you, do you wanna shut that I, I, That's what I just did, it just brought that one okay, right up. Yeah. right on. Sorry, yeah. Um, so, uh, so then solar is primarily retrofit sales, but with Intertex, uh, since we know, we'll be getting into this more later, but since we know so much about how much of the loads will be used for heating and cooling, and hot water in a home, we feel that we can be really good at a new construction design with solar and or storage. Uh, so then, then with solar, we're also thinking you can generate more leads for your businesses, whether it be electrical or heating and cooling uh, or roofing, whatever it may be. But by selling solar, we believe that it's gonna help your business grow. And as they say, you know, rising waters rise all ships. So and then consider the possibility of rebranding your business. Um, for example, if you um, if you have an electrical business or and you have electric, plumbing, heating and cooling, et cetera, that comes a long list. But if you have 
if you think about what you could do is, um, you know, call it like comfort and energy or air and energy, um, that this might be the time to do so. And the last point here is trust. And I, I kind of spoke on that above already, but you have the trust of your customers. You've been working with them for a long time and they, they know um, that you're going to provide them with a good system and a good product. And uh, that's, I think, one huge thing about the solar industry is because there is a lot of overnighters, um, or I, I guess I'll say companies moving in from out of state or popping up in states where there is uh, incentives. And so with your businesses already being established, we feel like you'll, you already have your customers trust and you'll go much further than you would uh, than somebody of your competitor. I will say. So on this one, um, this is the whole home to what we feel is, uh, you know, the, the future smart house. Um, and what, what different technologies can be incorporated into this? So geothermal and, of course, you know, everybody knows on here we're probably biased um, to where we believe everybody should put in geothermal. But. We're not opposed to heat pumps either. As long as somebody's all electric, that's what matters. But smart houses where you have an, a fully integrated home, um, and then as well as a smart metering and monitoring with your solar array, solar thermal, uh, that's something that we haven't broached yet. Um, it's a possibility in the future, um, but right now it's just it's something we just haven't had time to, to look into. The next thing we're looking into though, and not just looking into, we're uh, ready to pursue is batteries, AC and DC coupled batteries. And we'll talk more about those in the design segment um, next week. Um, uh, lastly though, is really our first phase. And that is the house, the home or facilities envelope. And it applies to heating and cooling, it applies to solar, um it, it applies to many things but that the envelope is what keeps down the loads the most so on this one we want to just showcase what our thoughts are and how we came up to uh our our four steps as we call it so we just spoke on insulating the home, making sure that the envelope, even insulating the roof deck, insulating the, the home and the, or the facility as tight as we possibly can get it. By doing so, we'll be able to reduce our loads for the, heat, the electric heating and cooling system. Again, I said we're biased, but geothermal is the most efficient way to heat and cool a home and do the hot water. So if you look at a pie chart of the um, of the average home, the users of that, uh, the, the loads, I guess you'll say, the largest loads at about 70 to 75% are heating, cooling, and hot water. The remaining 30, 25 to 30% is really doesn't matter because it can easily be changed out with, uh, you know, a refrigerator could be upgraded to a new one, or TVs, lighting, et cetera. But the big loads of the average home are the heating and cooling. So that's why we feel like that's the second step to take. And then third is since you've made your, you've gotten everything so tight in the home with the envelope, the heating, cooling, and hot water at that point can either be smaller, be a smaller system and re reduce the amount of kilowatt hours that it's going to use. At that point, we can then install our solar array that's going to not need to create as many kilowatt hours. And then lastly, would be considering the fourth step of energy storage. And energy storage is about to start. Um, and we feel that energy storage is going to be the majority of our business in the upcoming years. So do, these are all just things that we talk about, um, you know, net zero living uh, up to a zero dollar utility bills in kilowatt hours, you're always gonna have a meter charge. Adding value to the home, Zillow actually says that by a home, a home having solar, it'll add 4% on average to that home's value. Fossil free home, 
fossil fuel free home rather and then lessen the energy load and then state and federal incentives for solar and geothermal together really create a very economical um, opportunity to install both technologies. So we kind of, you kind of covered that, but basically, you know, this world, we're going to electric, you know, a lot of, uh, even some of these co-ops are, you know, they, they give you credits for, you know, all electric homes and things like that. They're trying to get away from that natural gas and the LP. So um, we're just kind of following along with the world trend uh, here at Intertech. So that's why we've moved on, moved uh, in with the solar industry as well. So uh, the future of energy, um, you know, we're going to, you know, try to stay with it and the technologies as solar panels change, you know, we're upgrading to the newest technology. Uh, and that's one thing, that's one of the things that do change quite a bit uh, is the actual panels themselves. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later on. But um, so, you know, where the world's going, you know, we've seen, you know, solar farms. If you've ever driven by the airport in Indianapolis, there's a big, huge solar farm out there. Uh, there's microgrids, uh, energy independence, you know, from uh, from the lines, grid resilience. Uh, so, you know, that's where we're going uh, as we travel down this solar pathway. Um, and as it changes and upgrades, we'll move right along with it and we'll upgrade our trainings and, and get you guys trained up on whenever the new technologies do come out. Because again, like I said, it's a it's like running changes on this stuff all the time. So um, we have to be a little bit flexible with what we do uh, in this solar. So as again, as things do change, we will inform you. So we're trying to get away from all the fossil fuels. Obviously it protects the earth. You can't make gas uh, or LP. Uh, it's natural in the, you know, from the earth. So if it were to run out, then we'd probably be in a world hurt, but, um, uh, for the safety factor and also the independence uh you know you're with with solar uh, i know you've probably seen some off-grid living shows or whatever but uh, obviously solar is uh, something that these people look at uh, wind as well uh, i don't really have a whole lot of knowledge on wind but yeah, we don't we don't look into a whole lot of that but uh you know with with not having uh propane or natural gas you're if you're all electric you can now make the energy that you're using and have an independence to make your own electricity uh, versus buying it from the grid. Yeah. So what is solar? So on the right here, this is a solar panel. Yep. And it's a photovoltaic Easy for you. solar modules. It basically absorbs direct sunlight and an inverter converts it uh, to an electrical uh, provider for your home or building. So the power coming out of those panels is gonna be a DC voltage. And then the inverter is just that, it's it's changing that power uh, from your AC to your, or excuse me, from your DC to your AC. Exactly, so this is an image of an actual wafer here or a cell that's on a, a module. And if you look at the, um, mouse for a second if you look at the actual the lines right here on top that is the actual silver that is on the uh, wafer itself so the uh, crystalline that makes up that wafer that's the black essentially what happens is is that we have if I say this correctly because um, I was not very good in chemistry but the photons release the electrons that move down the uh, the silver essentially creating a busing system, which slowly brings back the electricity to DC and then to the inverter, like John was just saying. Obviously, the amount of power that's going to create is obviously going to depend on how much sun it sees and uh, shading and all that Orient kind of stuff. So, latitude yeah. orientation, uh, yeah. meaning um, east, west, south. Uh, and then how, where you're at in the country, you know, in, in North America. 
Uh, there's no moving parts in these uh, in the uh, solar panels themselves, and there's very minimal maintenance, uh, if any. I guess if it got a lot of dirt or something, you might want to wash them off. But um, other than that, there's not a whole lot of maintenance or moving parts. There's not a whole lot to break uh, on a panel itself. Going through these trainings over the next couple of weeks, uh, you'll hear a lot of terminology. We'll just kind of go through some of this terminology. And I, you don't have to write all this stuff down. This training will be is being recorded. Once we get done today and everything gets wrapped up, uh, the uh, go to webinar will send you an email and let you know that you you can go back and you can go to that recording or you can go to go to webinar open up your account and you can go to your past webinars that you've attended and you can rewatch it there so uh if you miss something or uh need to go back and recheck something you can we'll definitely have a recording of the video for you or the training today for you so an array is an interconnected system of PV modules, so little panels uh, that function as a single electricity producing unit. Uh, smaller systems, an array could be one single module or one single panel, uh, or it could be 500 panels, uh, or module, I should say. The interconnection agreement, uh, there are stipulations put in place by a utility that met be that must be met by the owners of a solar installation to link their systems uh, with the grid. So always be in contact with your uh, electrical provider. It's easier to work with them from the beginning than it is to go back and uh, try to strike up a relationship after you've already got you know, some issues or you're trying to get it hooked up to your grid. So, and we'll discuss some of that, um, you know, speaking with the utilities, maybe even a little bit more today. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Inverters is a device that converts DC electricity from your modules uh, to AC, um, either for standalone systems or to supply power back to the grid. A micro inverter, it's an inverter. Uh, it's a plug and play device that's plugged into the solar panels that converts the DC to AC. Uh, the output from these micro inverters is combined is combined to power the array, which powers the house of the building, and then again feeds uh, excessive electricity back to the grid. Yep, we'll get more in detail on the difference between a, a regular inverter, yep. which we know as a string inverter, uh, and a micro inverter. Micro. But uh, generally speaking, a micro inverter is a one to one ratio, so one panel to one inverter. So we'll get back into that uh, later. Uh, module, it's an assembly of solar cells that uh, generates DC power under unconcentrated sunlight. Net metering, uh, producing excess energy that is then transferred back to the grid. Basically, it's gonna offset the cost of the power uh, draw from the grid, drawn from the grid. So it's basically, it's like, I, I, it's like spinning the meter backwards. It's metering it the other way, going back to the grid rather than into your home. PV or photovoltaic, or voltaic, sorry, that's a hard word for me, um, uh, refers to production of electric current at the junction of two substances exposed to light. So that's that positive and negative. Uh, um, electrons in the uh, in the panel themselves. The panel uh, physically connected a collection of modules. A solar cell is any device that directly converts the energy of light into electrical energy through the photovoltaic effect. Look at that, I got the word right. It only took me three times, but. Uh, in the SREC or solar renewable energy credit is a credit that owners of a PV solar system receive for every one megawatt of energy produced by their system and that they can receive monetary compensation for. So what you're basically selling it back to the power company or the utilities. So those are some of the terms that, uh, that we'll use here in these trainings going forward.
So basically this is a home and how solar works. Obviously, number one, you've got the solar panels on the roof. Uh, the sunlight hits the surface of the panel and it converts that energy to DC power. Number two, uh, down inside the home uh, is the inverter. So the DC electricity is sent from the uh, solar panels to the inverter and it converts it to a usable AC power for the home. You'll also have an electrical box. Uh, the AC electricity is sent to the breaker panel. Usable energy powers the house or the building while excess energy is sent back to the grid. So obviously we've got use from those panels, the power of the everyday appliances, cover the loads in the home. Um, you know, as you can see, it's just feeding all everything in past that electrical box. Um, so if you think about John, like uh, as an example, um, back in um, not too many years ago, and maybe some people even still have them as the, the older meters where they actually had wheels um, on there and they're actually spinning. What net metering is, um, is basically allows us to give back to the utility on a, a daily, monthly, uh, quarterly, or annual plan, depending on what they provide us. But if, if, at all, if they provide net metering at all, um, but what they allow us to do then is if I make two units of energy during the day and I only use one of those ener those units of energy during that day, I still have one extra. And then at night in a daily um, net metering application, at night I use my second unit of energy and starting the next morning, I am starting over with a clean slate and starting at zero again. So I use my credit at night because obviously the sun's not out and that's truly what net metering is. So it's it's really a true one-to-one -one, uh, ratio of credit coming from the utility. And another reason why that there's a misconception with solar that you have to have storage. You do not need to have storage uh, with solar. The grid actually acts as your storage bank. Um, but it's more of a credit uh, to your to a bill uh, type of scenario, I guess. But essentially, with the with the old days of the uh, the old meters, what we're doing with solar is we're either slowing down the meter, or we're making it stop, or even spin backwards. So what that and that's really what solar is doing with your your kilowatt hour usage, and then later on. Um, during the day, the grid will actually feed you back power and uh, you'll be able to use that power uh, with no cost, essentially, if you have, it just depends on the utility solar policy. Yep, <clears throat> there's a question on there. Okay, I got it. So price per watt, you want to? I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, so just just so everybody knows, solar really goes off of um, price per watt. So price per DC watt, and that's generally that's how you that's how we buy material. Uh, as sim in simple conversations, that's how you buy material from us. Um, and then how your consumer buys material uh, as well. So, um, you know, normally around, there's a street, you know, street rate, if you will. And for a 14.8 DC ground mount system, we're kind of, we, we, what we see a lot is the, the price of a certain price range. And I'm thinking, I can't remember what this one is offhand without getting my calculator, but two point, this one's going to be 2.7 uh, caught price per DC watt. So that's on a little bit, in my opinion, on the low side. Uh, usually we'll see something in the range of 280 to 290 price per DC watt. And then on, just so you can kind of see where you'll be at, if that's what the, the retail price is going to be, your same material price for that 
it, it could be, let's just call it like 160 uh, price per DC watt. And it kind of shows you what you're going to have in there for your material wholesale value as, and then your labor breakdown as well. So on that same size of system, once you're really good at, at getting your systems installed, that same size of ground mount, it, it should take you uh, in the range of probably a day and a half with three guys max, um, a three people, three installers max. So looking at you know your your installation costs on that, you're you're in the range of uh, twenty five hundred to four thousand dollars in material cost and late. I'm sorry, in labor, and then material costs. Um, if we just use that 160 price per watt with my trusty calculator here, um, times 14,800, you're looking in the range of 20, 23,680 plus that, um, plus that say $3,000 in material costs. And you're going to sell that job for 40,000. So it's really good money. One thing I'm, I'm I, the reason why I'm kind of stuttering over the price per watt costs is is not every job is the same. Um, and if you think about price per watt is more of a um, going to the Costco or Sam's Club and buying in bulk, the the more material you buy on a project and the easier it is to install and the longer it is uh, in one row, the more the price per watt comes down. Your most expensive price per watt is going to be on something that's smaller, uh, a smaller system on say a 12 or 13, uh, 12 pitch roof, and that's not going to be very big, uh, black on black. And I would say that that job retail could be over $3.50 uh, price per DC watt. Um, so just some examples that we can talk about um are a 4kw dc system and the slide's, slide's pretty simple um but let's just take a 4kw dc system and we'll provide i'm just going to throw out some numbers to you if you have your calculators out just do some just do some thinking here um a 4kw is going to be a higher price per watt so let's just say that that is one uh, and i'm just pulling a number out 175 price per watt uh, in a dollar 75 cents price per DC watt for that same that 4kw DC system so your costs on that are going to be so 175 times four thousand is you're looking at seven thousand um, dollars on that one and let's say that it is black on black it's complicated it's on a roof um, you know it could be uh, you have to work in multiple roof lines and uh, it's not exactly easy to get to so you're going to have a higher labor cost on that job let's just say it's going to cost um three thousand dollars to install that job even though it's smaller it's still going to take you a day and a half just to get it done so if you're looking at three thousand bucks you're, you're now at uh from billing and or i'm sorry for for your material and for your labor, you're looking at $10,000. All right, so let's just assume that that job is going to sell for 370. So I'm gonna take uh, 3.7 times 4,000. And it may not be enough, but in that situation, you're looking at 14,800. And 370 may not cut it for the margins that you're looking to make on that particular project. So. 370 may be a little low on that particular project's price per watt, but it all depends on your margins and where you want to be and then how much you want to sell to. So uh, are you looking to be a low, um, low margin, high volume or the other way around with uh, low, low volume, high margin? So it just kind of depends on, on how you want to approach it. But what we feel, the things that we're working on here in the hopper, um, we feel like a four, four or five kW will be the uh, our best seller. And then uh, 
another thing we'll talk about too in a little bit here is whenever I reference black on black, we'll get into that just in a minute um, for appeal and talking to con consumers on uh, what that'll look like. So a 9KW though, um, we can take the same exercise. So let's just say that our price per watt is going to be the same at $1.75 in material. Um, this one is going to be on a ranch style house on the roof. Um, so we'll take 175 times 9,000. That gives us 15,750 material cost and the majority of everything we're going to need. Um, we, we don't sell the uh, conduit and other uh, products that will be needed to do the installation, but we get you covered down to the end of the inverter, as I say. Um, so you're looking, you know, not very much 17,000 for the majority or from almost all your material costs on that project. I'd still say you're going to be looking at 3,000. Um, material, so you're at twenty thousand on this one, and uh, you, that's so your labor and your material included. You're at twenty thousand, so that job is going to sell for nine thousand times. Let's just take three seventy again. Thirty-three thousand three hundred. That one's becoming a little bit better money at the that 370 price per DC watt. And by running this exercise, what I wanted to show you is, is how the price per watt, how that changes with the smaller system you go. So with a smaller system you have, the higher the price per watt that it's going to either cost you and that it's going to cost to uh, the consumer at a retail rate. Some of the uh, environmental effects uh, that will have a you know an effect on your your panels and things. Obviously, snow. You know, if it's covered with snow, it's not really going to be generating any electricity. Uh, hail. They, what they say, softball size. It'll take up to softball size. Um, and I mean, if you got softball size hail, you're probably not going to be too concerned with your solar panels. Uh, you're probably going to be concerned about your vehicles and your home, the actual roof on your home, that kind of thing. So uh, it will take quite a bit of abuse before it does break. Obviously, temperatures, um, I guess you can kind of see uh, if you work with geothermal, you, you know, compressors, things like that, you know that uh, heat is bad. Uh, so same thing with these solar panels. The higher the temperature on that roof or where the panels are, the less actual output of voltage that it's going to send to the home. So if it gets you know too hot on that roof, it won't produce as much as say a 60 degree day would. Uh, just not as much energy is produced. Obviously, cloud coverage. You got clouds. Um, you know that's considered some type of shading. Uh, so you're not going to produce as much, obviously, with cloud coverage. Uh, Kyle, you want to explain this ratio of the shading, the one to three ratio? For sure. Um, oh, that's, yeah, okay. So that's that's just something I, I want to throw at everybody because it's usually a, uh, a forgotten point. Whenever you do, let's say that you're putting in a ground mount and um, you are you have a tree to the south of your ground mount. Whatever the height is of that tree or that obstruction, uh, could be a grain bin or, you know, or whatever, whatever the height is times three is your shading factor. So at the, you know, and well, I guess I'll use December 21st, that the sun is gonna be at this lowest point in the sky and the, the shade from that tree or obstruction is going to be the longest on the ground. So that we need to make sure that in that design process that we remember to move back our array so that we're not affected by the shade of that tree on the worst day of the year. Another thing that we see is uh, lack of experience with uh, ground mounts and putting them too close together. 
so that the one, you know, the one to the south is too close to the one to the north. And at that point, if you limit your shading, or I'm sorry, if you, you need to limit your shading so that whatever the height is of that ground mount times three is where the second row needs to start. So if your ground mount is eight feet tall, we need to make sure we don't start for 25 feet on that second row so that we don't have any issues uh, with shading ourselves in the future. Um, the next point here is a little bit of a joke, but uh, just so that we can talk about the resiliency of the solar panels, uh, modules is the, the real killer of solar is a 22 round. Um, just somebody shooting off in a field or whatever it may be, or practicing somewhere, and uh, that will actually hurt a module more than anything, or on a ground mount, um, that somebody hit runs into it with a mower that's happened a couple times to us around here um I, what i'm saying is though what i'm trying to reference is that hail and other weather effects um don't have nearly the um effect i guess i'll say that uh, the human interaction does to the to the uh resiliency of the modules and then another thing to throw at you, um, I, for a different presentation, I pulled in some information from Springfield, Illinois, weather bin data. And this one's a math question. Um, but spring, the middle of Illinois has 104 sunny days. That's not very much whenever you think about 365 days a year. And then 94 partly sunny days, which leaves us with 165, 169. 169 days of cloudiness. So that really affects how we do our designs and how many solar, how much DC we put on top of our AC inverters. So how many solar panels or kilowatts we put on our inverter for a sizing ratio. And we'll talk more about that in the design segment of our presentation. So this is the these are the components of the solar array. So starting on the left side, we've got obviously your solar uh, panel there. Uh, that little white box in the middle that is an inverter, as well as the two next to it. Um, the the one on the left, the white box is just an inverter. The one on the right, the two on the right there, uh, those are your micro inverters. So you'd have one of those micro inverters per one panel. Uh, and again, we'll discuss inverters in either three or four uh, segment of this training webinars. And then you've got a roof mount on the upper right there, and the lower right is a ground mount uh, solar panel array there. So you can kind of see. Um, kind of a difference there. So that's what is going to complete your whole solar array or your solar array there. Um, we had a question earlier, and I think this is a good time to, to bring it up. Uh, explain black on black. Um, and for the person that asked, asked that, thank you, because I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, if you look at the modules here on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see that the uh, you'll see the white diamonds on top on the one on top. That is the back sheet. So the, the wafers and the cells, if you will, are printed, laid um, on top of that back sheet. And that back sheet is a white material. We get the best performance when we have a white back sheet of, of a mono module. Uh, the, the second thing to notice about that module is the silver frame. And that silver frame um, is is an aluminum frame that's just uh, that's the cheapest way to go for the best bang for the buck, otherwise known as the best price per watt. So that's likely a 72 cell size um, that we'll we'll kind of reference as the cells on there are uh, six by what would that be six by um, 10. 12. So 6 by 12, where that module size is going to be 78 inches tall. 
And then the module to the right is a black on black module that's in the range of 65 inches tall. It's known as a 60 cell size. And that would be six by 10. Um, the width is about the same at 40 inches, but the frame, where, where I was really going with this, the frame and the back sheet and the, even the wafers all look black. So um, it is black on black. And what we do with our racking is a black material as well. So the reason why we do black is for appeal. The majority of roofs on at least new construction nowadays, I'll say um, are a black, a black shingle. And whenever you put a black on black array on top of a roof, it looks camouflaged into the roof, providing more appeal. So um, whenever you do black on black, you can expect about a 20% more, um, I would say, it's just a rough guess, but 20% more to do black on black than to do a, a white back, a white on aluminum uh, color, like this, the standard color to the left. Uh, and then a little bit more on the inverters, that's a solar edge inverter. That's a brand, one brand of string inverters we sell. Those use optimizers. Uh, the example of microinverters are there on the right, as John said. So um, anyway, I think uh, with that, we can probably move on for the moment. So the solar sales process. Uh, we do have some new marketing literature. So if you go to our website, you can uh, go in and find uh, these little sheets. It'll guide you through some of the tax incentives and uh, give a little homeowner guide about the actual uh, panels themselves. Uh, and I'm sure we'll discuss the black on white and the black on black as well. Yeah, those are new. Uh, we have those in stock. Uh, we can, those can be ordered with customer service. What we felt, um, what we felt about the, the solar industry and the storage industry is, um, really not trying to pick on anybody, but we felt that everybody is, uh, very, the, as far as manufacturers go, it's about me, 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 meaning like, uh, if they're an, a, a module manufacturer, they just made, uh, brochures on their product alone. Um, or if they're an inverter company, they just made brochures on that product alone and the racking the same thing what we noticed is there is a hole and uh, to helping a consumer understand what solar is how it works what their options are and uh, what we did with these uh, brochures is really try to hit home and give somebody the most information we possibly can so that they can research themselves and become more educated as a buyer So make sure, uh, obviously, in the uh, sales process, make sure we're, you know, getting, we're trying to conserve the amount of energy we're using. So obviously fix the bleeding points on the insulation, uh, airtight insulation, new construction and retrofits. Um, you know, so after you insulated well, you may want to consider that you may talk to the homeowner about using geothermal. Uh, because we're trying to lower the amount of energy that they're using, you know, so we can supply their power with the solar. So if we go with a unit that uses less energy, you know, that's obviously going to make the solar array, the ins installation and cost of it go down as well. So we would always recommend that you talk to homeowners about geothermal and getting more efficient equipment in their home. Uh, because with that, it's going to lower the amount of energy that they're going to be using, and it's going to limit. It's going to lower the the cost of the solar, uh, as well as the cost to run that solar. Uh, so, you know, with the solar, that's what we're just trying to do. We're trying to get a smaller footprint for that homeowner, uh, smaller uh, power consumption. It really starts you know, all back with the insulation. Yeah, I mean, nothing's changed in what we found in our, in our profession nothing has changed with the insulation is always the starting point because if you if you tighten up the envelope that means that your heating cooling system can be smaller and you want it to be all electric that and then therefore if it's smaller it means replacement parts are cheaper but most importantly if it's smaller it uses less kilowatt hours yeah and we want to use all you know that's the only energy we want to use is electric 
therefore our solar array can then be properly sized to with um, to the utilities um, solar policy, if you will. So again, he just talked about this. So if you've got the geo, you've got the insul installation, in insulation, excuse me, uh, obviously smaller energy loads, smaller solar array, reduced utility bills, and better state and federal incentives at that point. It really makes sense, John, on, um, let's call it a townhouse. Um, if you, if somebody has, uh, they, they have very limited roof space, you know, in a more uh, metro area. Um, so the percentage of coverage is more, is critical in those types of applications. So if, if you think about some of the very limited roof space, they can't put up much solar, but if you can help them be more energy efficient first, their solar will have a more, a higher load coverage percentage, um, if not be able to be smaller on that roof. Yeah. And then batteries, uh, we just did start getting into the batteries and we'll cover in one of these training sections uh, just on batteries. I think it might be even number six or something. I'm not really sure, but it will be coming up and we will discuss the battery uh, issues and uh, the current engineering status and uh, a little bit of the production um, price and generator and replacement, things like that. But uh, so we will get into the batteries later on, but you know, it's a whole, whole package. You know, they don't have to have batteries. Again, Kyle stated this earlier that basically the grid could be your battery if you're using the net metering your your grid would be your battery not saying that you couldn't do i'm not sure if they have it i'm not real involved with the utilities but even with a battery you could probably still do net metering uh once the batteries are full they're not going to take any more charge so at that point they could switch over and and start net metering back to the grid so you hit the nail on the head that is that's the generator replacement yeah. that would be for uh backup power so um with yeah. with the way things are going right now in society uh, in our world um we we are just have a theory that once we come out of this that uh storage is going to take a massive leap forward in sales yeah um just i, th I think we're gonna have a lot more i guess i'll say preppers yeah um so anyway we can move on um so why sell solar? Obviously, eliminate natural gas or LP, convert to all electric. The solars will, with the battery, uh, replace generator sales. Uh, it creates renewable alternatives for customers, so net zero living. Uh, you know, a lot of these homes, some of these homes now are going to that net zero living, so definitely uh, uh, solar is right on track with that. Uh, maintain customer journey and relationship. That's really, I mean, think about the four steps. That's a journey. Yeah. You know, if you sell, if you sell insulation, or, um, or you know, you sell it and sub it out, or whatever, uh, heating and cooling, you could sell it and sub it out. Uh, solar, same story and energy. But it's really, if you have a relationship with that one consumer, you're you're sending them on a journey of the four steps. And work. I mean, it's very, um, very good money for you. Um, as, as your business, but with your consumer, you're taking them on a journey to be with those four steps to be energy efficient as they possibly can be. And they're going to thank you for, for that in the end. And you're, you're going to be able to say, and I'll be back. And we're going to, you know, right now we're going to work on your insulation. Then we're going to work on your heating and cooling, getting you off of propane and get you, getting you to a heat pump. And then after that, we'll be able to set properly size your solar array. So that's that's why we feel it's a journey. So there's higher HVAC close percentages with higher revenue. Kind of talked about the revenue a little bit earlier on the price per watt and all that. Um, and I'm sure we'll cover a little bit more. Um, it's good money, quick work. Um, the energy changes. This is this is something I threw in there. Um, we're as a society we are going all electric uh we are going away from fossil fuels we're going away from petroleum uh, we can see that with other companies such as shell shell is uh, from if i'm saying this correctly no longer part of the petroleum consortium um in the u.s and looking at going electric 
um, moving moving their concentration to electric in time. And I, I think that um, we're going to see a huge shift in the way that we live our lives for energy. So that that's who Intertech wants to be. Um, and we would love for you to come with us. Um, and lastly, uh, that we don't talk a whole lot about yet, but we've also started selling uh, EV chargers, electric vehicle chargers as well. It's just in the last couple of weeks, isn't it? Yeah, we, uh, we really haven't even announced it yet. But again, that's back to all energy or all electric rather um, for an all electric world. So again, pricing, again, you can do the uh, roof mount, ground mount installation, uh, whichever the homeowner would prefer or has the room for. Uh, installer profits. We, we talked about that a little bit with our exercises. Yeah. Um, but moving on to the next one though, was our project spotlights. Solar, you know, one thing with geothermal uh, that we fight, we fought for years is you can't see it which is a great benefit to the consumer, but to us selling it, not so good because you can't see it. Therefore, you're not, the neighbors don't know who's doing what to keep up with the Joneses. Solar's sexy uh, is, and, and people can see that solar's going in and it makes that, it reminds them to look into it. And that's why we feel that Project Spotlights um, are great to show what you did with that solar array and the other technologies that you worked with in the home to help that consumer get to where they want to be. Um, maybe you did change out the heating cooling system. Maybe you increased their service size um, so that they can be all electric. Um, maybe you installed an uh, EV charger as well, but you can show um, by the monitoring how much that particular project cost to install if you want and then you can show how much money that consumer is saving uh, saving as well so um, project spotlights are really easy to do with solar and then the solar energy journey we kind of talked about that with the homeowner uh, the whole process in that and that just builds relationships with your homeowner correct the products we offer and why we chose these vendors uh, there's a few more I think that uh, these are this is kind of this little solar line card is probably going to be like a rolling changes because as things change so do we so the modules are what move the panels themselves um but our uh, inverters and our racking remain consistent so the modules may change but we could still use a different module on the racking and the inverters they're not really too picky on certain types of um, those panels, but the modules, like I said, uh, technology changes, they get cheaper, uh, they get better, so those will change. So you'll see some of them on here, the modules, we sell the Q-Cell and the Axitech, um, but that could definitely change. It already has before, so it definitely wouldn't surprise me if the modules do change. But the main part, the inverters that you'll be working with, um, those are going to stay the same in the racking. Uh, so once you get used to kind of installing those, the modules themselves installing those, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, um, kind of a, after you get a mounted level and all that, you know, there's kind of a plug and play type thing. The inverters where you power things up, those are going to be a little bit more difficult, but you'll be using the same ones most of the time. So, uh, it is hard to make changes in the field. Let's say, uh, you got. Uh, if you had to change your racking, uh, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So I would recommend that you keep some inventory and truck stock of your different racking needs, uh, as well as the inverters. Um, so you know that um, if you need something that you will have it. Uh, you never know where things are really going to go right now with this whole coronavirus and getting materials that, you know, the feronius inverters may not be able to get a capacitor for six months so not saying that they won't start building them again but in this time right now we probably need to maybe have a little bit of stock on your truck or a little bit of extra in case that uh, you'll need it later on down the down the road exactly so the the racking is what i've seen out of, of customers is um it's well first of all some we may try a new racking type, but uh, 
we may not have enough stock. And the array changed uh, once the customer, you know, once the installer got there and they have to work around a roof vent. Um, that changes the racking um, layout and they can need more end clamps or more rail length at that point. Um, and it's really hard on us to make those racking changes and it's also hard on our installers, our customers, to make racking changes because they have spare parts on their trucks um, or extra parts, extra feet, extra mid clamps, in, uh, in clamps, et cetera. And that we're just letting everybody know that um, we try to make selections on good products and stick with them on inverters and racking, but expect changes with modules because loyalty on modules is not rewarded. Um, we basically just see price uh, creeping if we stick with one manufacturer. Um, but on the line card as it is, you expect changes. We're actually going to be releasing um, a new line card um, in the upcoming days and we'll have batteries on there, uh, new modules, um, the racking, we're adding some racking companies on there as well. Um, so just expect some more some more options moving um, in the upcoming days here. Yeah, the, the, the whole, the solar in general, uh, really, I mean, even our geos now, there's changes all the time. So we've got to roll with those changes. So you'll see the solar, um, even the trainings themselves, as we get new vendors and uh, different manufacturers of equipment, more different training. And so, you know, you could come to this training this year and next year it could be totally different. So, um, I mean, we want to try to stay as, you know, close to on track as we can, but you never know what's really going to happen. So um, it is a rolling change. The inverters we offer right now, we have AP Systems, uh, Fronius, and Solar Edge. And the racking, we use Unirack, um, Preferred uh, Pipe, and Iron Ridge. The, uh, I'm not too familiar with the, uh, uh, preferred uh, line product. That's it, what it is. It, perform, it used to be DPW, and they got purchased mm -hmm. by Preferred. And um, we use them for a lot of ground racks. We use Unirack for a lot of uh, flat roof applications, and then Iron Ridge for both ground racks and pitched roof applications. And the Iron Ridge uses like local pipe, is that correct? Yeah, so whenever you do one of their ground mounts, you actually go out to your local um, pipe supplier and you get a thick walled um, three inch pipe uh, to spec uh, that will give you with the design and actually source those locally because if we're shipping a far distance, it makes zero sense to ship um, that across the country when it's already there. So we'll be shipping rail that the modules will sit on and other um, connecting components, but you'll be able to get the pipe locally. Solar incentives, uh, there are some federal tax credits. If you were in it last year, uh, you, up till 1231 of 19, there was a 30% tax credit. Now it's kind of stair-stepping backwards uh, as we go through. So 2020, there's a 26%. In 2021, there'll be a uh, 22%. Um, federal tax credit. Correct. Uh, there's MACRS accelerated bonus depreciation. Uh, do you want to cover that? That's on com yeah, that's on commercial. Um, so businesses can get 100% accelerated bonus depreciation, which is a MACRS schedule. And I we're no CPA here, but depending on that business and what they can depreciate, this means that they can depreciate 100% of the project in the first year. So with geothermal, our, for example, is, uh, is just something to compare to. Um, we have a different depreciation schedule on that technology. And I believe that they, that, that technology can do two years depre uh, depreciation schedule on that one. So I just wanted to point out the difference between those depreciation schedules. Uh, the next thing is the USDA REAP grant. And this is something that I've been encouraged to look into quite a bit more. And uh, you can apply for the REAP grant on up until the 31st of March and then up until the 31st of October. 
um, as long as you've applied for the grant, um, we consider it to be more of a gift. Um, try for it. Um, if you don't get it, not a big deal, um, but it'd be a nice gift if you do get it. Uh, what we do know about it is, is that it's points based. So the more, uh, if you just do a solar uh, application, it's not a smart move. Um, but if you can do add multiple technologies together, and again, not to be biased, but the grant writers tell me that the best thing to do is actually do solar and uh, lighting or solar and geothermal. And uh, that will get you more points to get awarded the grant. In certain states like Iowa, there is a statewide tax credit available. Uh, certain utilities like uh, in Kentucky uh, have uh, utility incentives directly from the utility themselves for solar. And then states like Ohio, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania either had or has a few uh, SREX available too in their state. And those are re solar renewable energy credits and um, those are uh, basically a contract with the state or the utility to be able to produce energy over the course of, of a term or time, and they're gonna pay you upfront for that. So um, we, we don't get into too much detail on those SREX because we don't wanna waste um, somebody's time that not, may not be working in an area with SREX. Uh, financing. You can use a clean energy credit union. Uh, this is some information on it. Uh, if you'd like to contact them for some financing. Um, like all credit unions require to have a field of membership, which is loosely defined, obviously. Um, they are members of the Solar Energy Society, a nonprofit organization. And again, uh, if you want to uh, get some financing, there's some uh, some of their terms there. I'm not really going to cover a whole lot of that. It, the Clean Energy Credit Union is the savior in financing we've been looking for for years. Um, they're a not-for-profit, a non-for-profit uh, organization, and they have zero dealer fees. And let me re repeat that: zero dealer fees, zero down to the consumer. Uh, it is a non-secured loan. And um, there's a couple, two more benefits. Um, no early payoff penalties. Um, their rates are usually, it's right up there on the screen. Um, they're in that five and a quarter to over six, just depending on the person's credit score. Uh, and they can loan in a household up to 50,000 on a, on a residential project. So Clean Energy Credit Union is only for residential. And this is a great program. And uh, just my advice to you is, is you should not sell solar without financing. Always sell with financing. And this is a great program for residential use. Just also note that the rates that are shown there, that five and a quarter to 6%, that's showing a 2% discount on automatic withdrawal or automatic payments. So it actually would be if they're not making auto withdrawal, it'd probably be you know seven to seven to eight percent. So uh, financing options. Um, go back or forward. Uh, forward. Go ahead. Yeah. Financing options on residential. Obviously, they can pay cash. Uh, some people may want that route, but we never recommend coming in um, swinging for cash. Uh, you know, as Warren Buffett said, it's better to use somebody else's money if you can get a good interest rate on it. Um, so I think even again, back to our current economic state that we're going to be looking at in the upcoming months, I think that everybody's going to be holding on to their cash. And that's a good, that's a smart decision. So uh, taking out, selling with financing is the way to go. So there's cash, there's leases available. Uh, on residential, uh, residential leasing is not as popular as it used to be. Um, and then there's a local lenders. We can always suggest a local bank. Those always do well. And then lastly, we were just talking about Clean Energy Credit Union as well, too. Um, 
we've been selling, uh, we've been trying to sell to commercial outfits, and we've uh, we've been doing well. But one thing that we noticed on, on the jobs that we weren't getting or aren't getting is because we're assume we've assumed that these businesses have cash on hand. Uh, uh, newsflash, they don't, mm -hmm. and they the businesses aren't cash rich by um, just by statistical data, um, we have to assume that a business is going to need some sort of uh, financing option. We're working on something with a uh, a bank actually for U.S. market right now for commercial loans that will also be non-secured. So um, hopefully we'll be able to build a program with them in the next couple of months for commercial. And I think that'll be a huge opportunity for everybody in the solar industry. The next topic to talk about here though is power purchase agreements, which you'll see these called a PPA. And at that point, you can, someone, uh, the person, a financer can essentially own a system that will be on the property of a customer, but the customer, instead of paying say, say 11 cents after tax and everything, price per kilowatt hour, maybe with a PPA they'll pay seven cents and not have any money out of pocket. A PPA lasts about 25 years, 20 to 25 years with buyout options. A virtual PPA, same thing, except that with a virtual PPA, this is where you may have heard of community solar, where you can have solar being generated on one site, but somebody can subscribe to that power essentially at a different site. So they can be getting, you know, air quote here, solar energy from somewhere else that they've subscribed to. And last is a lease, commercial lease, um, where we see a lot of leases right now, and or at least people trying for leases, where the financer takes the 26% federal tax credit, they take that depreciation, and they take any other local incentives and then the uh, the site owner can take the can purchase the system after six years, I believe. So year at the end of year six, they can then purchase the system for a greatly reduced price on that system, and they just basically take their power bill amount and pay that towards their lease payment. So it's kind of, it can get complicated, but there's a lot of opportunity out there, even if you yourselves uh, chose to um, do be the financer with a project, and then you can defer your income for seven, for six to seven years and not have to take it all in one year. That gets complicated. That's almost a little bit above my head, but I'm dangerous with it. <laughs> Basically, um the first thing we always want to do, again, we kind of showed you those design forms. And so, you know, we're going to need to get the contact information, name, address, the phone number, uh, 12 concurrent months on the electrical bill, uh, include LP or natural gas bills as well. Uh, so we can kind of compare uh, the apples to the oranges there. Um, report any energy hogs, they got a hot tub or a pool or um, you know, anything like some kind of major electric heat or something somewhere, let us know that as well, uh, so we can make sure to design around those parameters. Uh, make a note of where they would, where the meter is located and their circuit breaker as well. Uh, if it's a commercial unit or a commercial business, include the phase and the voltage. Uh, don't just guess at that voltage, uh, make sure we get the correct voltage on that. Obviously, you're going to have to choose whether you want a ground or a roof mount. Explain homeowner expectations. So their their goals for their for their panels. Do they want to supply 100% of their power all the time? Um, you're going to have to look at these kind of arrays because you could get into where you're definitely oversizing. And when you oversize, obviously, cost goes up and everything like that. So we want to try to keep it... Um, you know, we just don't want to build a power grid for the homeowner and just say, oh, let's just use 40 panels and, uh, you know, that, we don't want to oversize grossly, but we don't want to undersize as well. So we need to learn what they want out of the system. 
you know, knowing the utility is really the number one thing with consumer expectations. And I, I had a customer yesterday say something to me about, you know, in that realm of, uh, you know, there's going to be a con, you have a two story house and there's going to be a big gray conduit coming down the outside wall of your home. Uh, are you okay with that? And so those are just, those are things that, um, you know, what the array will look like, what the percentage of coverage that we can do or that we should do um, is, you know, part of the consumer expectations. But the more that you can tell them up front, the better off you are. And that's where we're just trying to display yeah. here is that it may not be good to swing for the, I call it swinging for the fence. 100% um, coverage uh, bill offset may not be the way to go and probably isn't. 25% um, may be the way to go, 25% uh, bill offset anyways, um, may be the best way to go and it'll probably make you the most successful. Uh, and the last point here is utility information. Um, the state utility code, uh, the NEC local code and incentive programs and their solar policy are all things that we need to evaluate with you so that you're, it's really hard for us to know all the utilities. We're doing our best, believe me, but if you're able to have a good relationship and pick up the phone and, and talk to the utility, you're, you're best off to know what size of system we should do and what's best for that utility as well. If the utility's happy, you're going to be happy in the long run. So handling customer expectations, things to be upfront about is a selected product. So if it's black on black or, you know, white on black, just let them know what they're going to get. Show them a picture. Um, you know, you can go to our website and we have product spotlights there as well. So, you know, you can pull those up for your homeowner and say, well, this is similar to what your home is going to look like with a ground mount. Um, you know, we've got marketing information. Definitely uh, just be upfront with their with the product and where it's going to be mounted, whether that's on the roof or the ground. Again, examples of what it's going to look like and the kilowatt and hour production versus the possible bill reduction. Um, obviously, just because you install solar doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to save the money. Um, you know, if it's not sized properly, things like that. Another thing, yeah, I mean, I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but just because you have solar doesn't mean you can leave the lights on in every room moving forward. Yeah. Um, just because you're installing solar doesn't mean you're going to be guaranteed to save money. What you can guarantee is the energy production. Um, and, and we do see a lot of success with guaranteeing energy production, um, but you just can't, you shouldn't and can't guarantee that somebody's going to for sure save money on their bill. Yeah. Again, that color system, we talked about that. You got black on black or black on or white on black on white, not white on white. We don't have any totally white panels. No, that could be blinding. Uh, this is just an example of an electric bill uh, for the year. Now on this, you'll see we've got actually 13 months. And what we want to use is the the most current 12. Uh, so we go back to February uh, and then run all the way through January. And you could basically add those up and divide and that will give you your average monthly use. I believe uh, if everybody wants to go ahead and grab your calculators out. And those, uh, let's go for 12 months. So let's start at February and work our way to the current January. Our total on that is, I'm going to give it a second here and do as fast as I can. I believe it's 43,000 something. Correction, I'm getting, as long as I did that right, I'm getting 72,579. I don't believe that's right, but 
Um, it, nonetheless, uh, we'll just take it and run with it. Uh, so what we do with this equation, we know that this utility is a annual net metering utility on commercial with this with this particular site. So we're just going to design up the, the system to where we're going to use, we're trying to offset their bill at 100% on this one. We're gonna go ahead and swing for the fence because this utility allows us to do so. So, um, yes, thank you, so, um, Mitch and Scott, 42,579 is the accurate number. I must've hit something on my calculator or didn't clear it out. So what we're going to do in this equation is we're looking at 12 months. We're gonna add up those 12 months of usage because in this case, it's Ameren, Illinois. Ameren, Illinois allows us to net meter throughout the year annually and lets us take the option of April 1st. So essentially, since we're all electric, we're gonna make quadruple the energy that we need, as an example, in the summer and har harvest that. And just like preparing for the winter, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna basically hibernate and get our supply and let our summer production take us into the winter. Uh, in the winter, we can see about half of what we do in the summer as far as production goes. So the, our total is 42,579. We're gonna divide that to get our DC system size. We're going to divide that number for this site location. We're gonna divide that by 1.4. If we had a ground array on the site for this one at a 30 degree angle for this latitude, um, and the latitude 1.4 really covers pretty well from Little Rock, Arkansas to almost Green Bay, Wisconsin. So there's pretty big belt line across there that that 1.4 factor will uh, cover for the US. And what we're looking at on this one, since I took that number, is 30,413 is what our DC, relative DC system size should be on a ground mount facing south at a 30 degree angle. And what we can do though is also, and what I, this is just my hand written way to go. If I was meeting with somebody at, at the kitchen table or something, this just gives me some numbers to start off from. So if I need, you know, if I need a 30,000 kW, 30,000 and a half kW system, um, I'm gonna just assume it's gonna be anywhere between 30, 31, 32, somewhere in there. And then our DC system size ratio, we take and subtract 25%. So, and that's really not accurate. What we are going to do is look for a inverter size, AC size, that is going to allow us to add on about 25% extra DC on top of that. So I'm just gonna take 25 kW because I know that Feronius in this case has a 12 and a half kW inverter available. I'm gonna take two of those, that's gonna give me 25 kW. So I'm just gonna, by experience, I know that that inverter size is available and I'm gonna aim for uh, I'm, what I'm looking to do is get to 100% of my AC size so that when we look at our DC system size of around 30, we should come out to a good healthy design system at 125%. So I'm gonna uh, multiply 25 times 1.25. That gives me 31 and a quarter. Well, just by my numbers, that's a little bit uh, more than what I need, but it's within range. So I can do that 25 kW AC system with a 30 and a half kW system on the DC system size, just depends on what my modules come out to be. Uh, generally, we sell in two in pairs. So if I have a 400 watt module, and I'm gonna divide 30 and a half, 30,500 divided by 400.
gives me 76 and a quarter modules. So I'm just going to go for uh, 76 modules then. So 76 again times 400 is a 30,400 30, watts, a 30.4 kW DC system. So that is what I came up with by the usage on the site. And then what you can do is go back to PV watts, which it's an in-rail site, the government site that's generated, and you can double check your numbers. Uh, that's how you design the system up and see what approximately needs to be. Um, but the numbers I've just given you by a hand calculation gives you enough to be very dangerous at the job site or in conversation with somebody. And you're, you already know where your cost is going to be because remember we talked earlier about price per watt and the DC system size range. So if I know that I have a 30.4 system, 30,400 times, I think that job should sell in the range for um, probably $2.50 uh, $2 price per DC watt. I'm going to be selling that system for $76,500. Um, and the, since the margins are so good and you really kind of know where you're already going to be, that calculation keeps you within range. You know, you know where you're around where you're going to be, and you can go back and double check your numbers um, using PB Watts or Intertex Design Team um, to, to help you with that. So um, anyway, let's move on from that calculation. Make sure you always stop, talk to the utilities, uh, start a good relationship, obtain their solar policy and their solar tariff rate. Uh, so basically what they're gonna buy that power back at. And if they're gonna buy it at all, there are some places that you can't even sell power back to them. So you could send power back to them, but they're not gonna pay you for it. Um, right. So you know if that's the case, that's the case, but uh, you may wanna definitely put in some batteries so you can at least have a little bit more of your own power I know some of the Caribbean islands and stuff they don't they don't buy back right now. So well, they're and, on diesel. That's where the uh, Hawaii, California, yeah. and the Caribbean are where we're told that storage is going to get its start. Um, but they, you know, I I, I think uh, Steve said that the uh, Cayman Islands buy at 48 cents per kilowatt hour. They don't give much credit back, if any, uh, on a sheet that I saw and they don't want you to have very big systems. In that case, it makes very logical sense to have a battery storage backup option. Um, but what we're referencing here is that if you have a good relationship with the utility, pick up the phone, call them, go meet with them. Uh, anybody that's within your service area, go talk to them and, and have a good relationship. Because what we've seen throughout the years now of selling solar is, is that solar installers and utilities get along about like oil and water. Um, that's kind of a lot of finger pointing and what we've seen the most success with is, um, is the old term, you know, um, fight them with kindness and talk to them about what's best for the utility, which is usually best for the member. Um, and it really will tell you how to design the system to the percentage offset that's best for the consumer. And to clarify what I was talking about earlier, 25% bill coverage may be all that you get. Um, it may be the smartest way to go. You And it up to 25% is what I'm saying. Um, but in other utilities, uh, you know, half may be a good number of their bill coverage and maybe 100%. So it just depends on what's good for you and for the member and the utility. And we strongly recommend a good relationship because it will pay off. Yeah. And basically it's, we're developing the project at this point. Right. Yeah. That is what's called the project development. It's more than design. It's a, it's, it's a strategy yeah. and, and put it together. There's three points that I did forget to mention to throw into the, um, presentation and I see that here on only a um, for situations where we have very low uh, utility buyback for that solar and we want to aim for optimal self-consumption which is why 
you keep hearing me say go back to 25% or even 20% of their bill coverage. If you have a utility that doesn't pay for the solar to be put back onto the grid or you're not getting any credit for it, only designed for optimal self-consumption. And what we found is, is that the solar industry gives up in states where, let's just say Nebraska, um, I believe that at least they didn't have a net metering policy in place and uh, what they don't give any credit back for solar being on their grid. Well, you don't see much solar around, obviously. There's one scenario where it makes sense to have solar. If you have a heat pump, and again, we're biased, if you have geothermal heat pump, it makes sense to have a small solar array for optimal self-consumption. There's three terms. There is production of solar, there's consumption back from the grid, coming at you from the grid, and then there's self-consumption. So that energy that the solar is making is never gonna go back to the grid you're always going to self-consume it with your systems that you have, your energy users in the house. Or if it does go back to the grid, it's a very minimal amount, which is kind of going back to the reason, the rationale to where I said earlier, we feel like a 4KW solar array is gonna be our best seller um, because that's going to fit on, that application will at least fit on every project out there, as long as they have electric heat. Um, anyway, I just want to describe that real quick. All right, so utilities continued. John just gave me a look. Um, this is one that, uh, that this is kind of explaining our future. So there's tariffs. Uh, tariffs are a fee, a, a buy rate that you, you know, your consumption rate that you buy from the utility, just like, you know, somebody would now. But the feed-in rate is a different scenario so some utilities aren't net net metering and they have you buy at 13 cents for example and then you they buy back your solar energy at say four and a half cents so that is not net metering that's just their solar policy and those are two numbers to to know so whenever you call and talk to the member services person at a co-op for example that's your two points that you need to ask. What's what's my tariffs, uh, feed-in rate and my buy rate for my member here? And the last question to ask is, what is the true update or how does the true up process work? Is it monthly, quarterly, annually? Um, that's the third question to ask. For example, we were just talking about Amer in Illinois earlier. Their true update is April 1st, but Another one is, um, I'll throw out Tri-County Electric. Um, they have size limitations. So they have quarterly true updates and you can, with the 10KW inverter, um, that you get quarterly net metering. It's good, but it's not great. And uh, so it gives you those size limitations of a 10KW inverter quarterly net metering. So we need to size the system accordingly for the production. Uh, if you look at the year in, in quarters, summer's gonna be great, fall's okay, or it's good, spring is okay, winter's really bad. So as far as production timelines go, so we just kinda take a look at those and we evaluate what does our system size need to be for thinking about working with the utilities uh, guidelines that they have in place. Now, the the system that you see, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, graph that you see on the right, this is what's known as the California duck back curve. Looks like a duck, right? So your numbers here, 2020, or 2012, Rather, in California, there was virtually, this is the grid, uh, there was virtually no solar on the grid, and that's what a, the gray bar looked like in, in that state. And then solar started coming into play, and, you know, it's less than 10 years ago that it's really made its mark and started to become the, the giant that it is. Um, with year to year, you start to see the grid come down. So 12 a.m. to 6 a.m., and then you see 9 a.m., 
no matter what time of year, 9 a.m. is when the sun comes out every day. And you start to see the grid just drop um, down to, you know, a very minimal amount. Then the sun goes away at 6 o'clock. Everybody's home from work. Everybody has a massive influx of power that they're requesting to um, to cook, to do dishes, lighting, TVs, stereos, et cetera, in their homes. And that's where we see this massive spike in the grid. This is how Intertech and our technologies, how we want to help this grid, because this is coming, you know, everything starts in California, as we know, and it moves this way. So in the upcoming years, this is what we can expect. And this is where storage will do quite well because it'll reduce that spike at eight o'clock. See the top, the head of the duck, and it will want to decrease the the ramp of that um, spike and bring that down to a more flat line level. And that's again where heat pumps, particularly geothermal, can help that as well throughout the entire day. And so that's where we, we see our technologies helping the most is how can we help this scenario because solar, to be quite honest, is putting lots of stress on the grid. But with storage and geothermal, we hope to, we hope to bring down the overall level down to a manageable amount for the grid management. Um, and then mind you, with this happening, Californians are also having to ground electricity. So, you know, they're at, 1.30 in the afternoon in 2020, there, there's so much energy being produced onto the grid, but there's such a high demand that the, the fossil fuel plants or the nuke plants have to maintain the peak. So it's really hard for them to fluctuate the production of energy that they're making. So you have all this coming on from the grid and from the power production lines, and it's being some of that energy is being grounded. And that's why storage is going to take such a, a high, a high uh, market coming up, and be able to offset that that grounded energy. But solar is a necessary stepping stone to get there. So we're creating stress on the grid, but in time, we'll with storage and other technologies, we'll be able to be a um, renewable, renewable energy, yep, renewable energy grid. Add-on sales, uh, combine your services, electrical, uh, make sure if they're going from a natural gas to a heat pump that they're uh, increasing their service size or if they just want to increase it, um, that'd be a good time to do it anyway. Obviously batteries, uh, generators, communications upgrades, we can have, you know, there's all kinds of uh, different things for these inverters where you can communicate and see, you know, what you're producing. It's got communication that'll tell you what panel is producing what. If one's underperforming, it'll let you know. So uh, there is communication and controls that the homeowner can access, uh, which is which is nice. Obviously upgrade their HVAC, uh, insulate it pretty well. And we would recommend putting a geothermal heat pump, seeing how we're a ge geothermal heat pump manufacturer, uh, but we would definitely recommend some type of heat pump. And also indoor air quality, uh, especially with more and more tighter homes, you know, they're not getting fresh air and things like that. So it's something that we definitely want to look at. And while they're, you know, doing some solar, might as well see if they, you know, need to uh, add a ERV or an HRV or, or something along those lines. So uh, always remember your add-on sales to go along uh, to complement the solar. Uh, return on investment for proposal. I will let Kyle take this one. <laughs> so this is an image. What we do in our designs is uh, we first design the system. Uh, offer your request back to that design form. De depends on the particulars of the project. But as you can see here, this if if you look closely, this is actually a an image of us. We drawn this car dealership on with our design tool and believe me it the design tool has the knowledge um it makes us the design tool makes us look really good uh in other words but what what's happening here with this building is we were able to draw the obstructions 
we're able to see with LIDAR here, the, uh, the blue and the red and the yellow, the green showing the trees, um, but the, this blue is actually like cars and it's showing us the height of this building so that we can work to see what the pitch is, where the obstructions are, what the shading would be from trees that are across the way there. Um, and what we're able to do is show this model essentially to the consumer to let them know that we've done the design on this, we know what will fit, we know what the production will be, and we're able to give that over to you for your proposal to the consumer so that they can see a visual and that you've done your due diligence to uh, on, on the project. So let's go to the next slide. So we'll also give you, um, we'll also give you this document here that will show the production. Um, likely we'll be going for a little bit over production than, uh, than what we see right in, um, in this case, I guess, you know, 100%, but modules, panels, they degradate they die just like anything else sitting outside they die at a half a percent every year meaning that they lose efficiency or they're a half a percent off of their rated number so if we had a 400 watt module like we we're just talking about it's going to degradate every year at a half a percent so that's why we if we have a good utility with a good net metering policy in this case we're going to design to over a hundred percent, and but not not to exceed 110 percent. That way, for many years to come, they can have a their energy covered at 100 uh, percent for many years and still be they make a little bit more than what they use. Lastly, this uh, you know here I've broken the golden rule, but uh, we use some cache documents uh, on here. If you tell us what, uh, after we do the design, you think through what you're doing uh, with the project, you, you've evaluated it, you know what work needs to be done, you know what your price per watt is going to be or what the dollar amount is on the project that you're going to be at, we'll submit back to you, after you tell us, we'll submit back to you within the electronic folder that we'll be using and we'll tell you exactly what you can present to the consumer. And what I mean by that is, is that we'll give you everything you're going to need to put into your proposal. So we'll be able to give you this document or these, uh, these graphs here to show the payback period on the project and what their cumulative and annual cash flows are going to be so that they can see uh, how, fast that this, how fast their return on investment will be for the project. But I said I broke the rule here because I put in cash and not financing. So this is a commercial project that we assumed they had the cash. And uh, a very funny story on this one because it's a car dealer. And uh, we got our hands slapped on this one kind of because car dealers are actually do very well. But, um, and they have lots of cash, but they don't want to let go of that cash and uh, when, for when they need it, and they may need it right now. Um, so this is a, it was going to be a high dollar project, and um, if the car dealer had all this cash available, um, but in the end, he's like, you're gonna save me 30,000 a year in expenses. Um, I can make that in a day. So what do you say to that? A lot of it was really hard to come back from that one. So <laughs> anyway, um, that's just uh, just a little bit of backstory on this particular project here. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. That's it. Okay, that's the last slide. <laughs> All right, before we jump into questions and comments, um, we, this is a six-part webinar series. Our next series will be on solar design, uh, which will segue into a lot of what we've already talked about today. And we'll be talking about design on solar and batteries, and uh, we're, we can probably talk all day on design. But um, anyways, join us next week, and I believe it'll be at 9 a.m. on Wednesday again. Um, so you'll have to re-register, and uh, you'll be able to find it there on the link. And we'll be sending out a, our follow-up email. We'll have that within as well. Yep. And again, the recording 
once everything gets wrapped up and the webinar closes everything out, it should send you an email uh, with a link to go back and listen to the training, or you can sign back in to go to webinar and you can go to your past trainings and the recording should be there as well. If you have any problems getting to those or you've got any more questions, definitely uh, give us a call or shoot us an email and uh, we will uh, get you taken care of. All right, uh, so we have some questions, John. Okay. Um, uh, while every, oh, I'm sorry, correction, Carly got me. It's not on Wednesday, it's on Thursday. Thir yeah, I have another training on Wednesday next week. Um, so I've got the que some questions here. Um, is our systems expandable? Yes, they certainly are. Um, somebody can add on some now, and if they only want to do, like I kept pointing at 25%, um, they can uh, do, let's say they can add on another 25% to get them to 50%. The, it's nice to know that up front so that we do a system design that it can plan on expansion um, with microinverters. That's a great way to do that. Um, so microinverters are a great way to do system expansions um, because they're that one-to-one -one ratio as we talked about. Um, so hopefully that answers that question, um, but it's very, very easy to add on as long as we have the space. All right, so uh, here's, an, here's the one that I wanted to save to the end. Um, a house uses 12 uh, kilowatt hour, 1200 kilowatt hours per month. What system would get them to zero in that month? How much does a 4KW and 9KW compare, compare to use? Great question. And um, the person that asked is a heating and cooling person. So I'll ask you the question back. How big do, does my heating and cooling system need to be? And this is rhetorical, uh, meaning that uh, we don't really know. You know, there's more questions than answers. And we don't know what the loads are of that house. Now you can make some assumptions, but until we know exactly what we're dealing with on that site, uh, it's hard to say. Um, but if you take that, if we take the calculation that we had earlier, um, in just that month of production, 1200 uh, divided by 1.4, In that month, we would need a DC system size. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just take 1,200 in that case with a good utility. I'm gonna multiply that out by 12. So that's an annual usage uh, of 14,400. Now I'm gonna divide that by 1.4. DC system size on that particular uh, scenario at 12 months of product or usage would be about a 10 kW system. Um, but the orientation is depending. Uh, if you do it on the roof, likely you're not going to uh, get that 30 degree angle. So you may go to a 10 and a half on that particular case. But uh, what we'd like to do is just say, send us the power bills, send us an email, let's just get the conversation started. Um, and then we'll work on the design to see what we can do with that particular site and after we evaluate the utility. We got a great design team back there to definitely help you guys out. So that's, you got questions, that's probably gonna be the first place we go is we'll talk to Angelique and Jeremy and um, about their opinions, things like that, what they've seen. You know, they, they're basically doing these designs all day, every day now, so. Uh, we're getting pretty good on them. Do you have a catalog of uh, utility policies you've dealt with? Um, we have done a bad job of logging those. Um, I've been thinking a while about making an Excel spreadsheet for those utilities um, to where we can know what those utilities are. Um, but there's software that we use. Uh, we use Aurora and they do a decent job of keeping track of the utilities information um, as well as we're starting to look at uh, energy tool base and they will help us with those utility rates as well so uh, to answer your question no 
um, but it's a very good idea that we should start to log um, those utilities information. Uh, where are you coming up with the cost per kilowatt for install like the 3.7 or the 1.5 cost? I am pulling those out of experience, um, just throwing some numbers out there for the exercise. They were more examples, um, but their street, their street rate experience numbers that we've seen uh, for numbers on, on those particular size of projects. Um, so to answer your question, I'm, I'm just kind of use some examples and um, we, it just depends on the projects on where they'll come out at in their numbers, price per watt. Uh, same kind of question we just had. Um, I, I was just, again, um, back just finishing up on uh, the price per watt equation. Um, it, it, every job is different. Uh, every size is different on that price per watt. And uh, not to do a rabbit trail here on that, but it just really depends uh, on the site and, and how uh, what products are selected and um, only use the numbers that I gave you as uh, numbers just to uh, use for examples today. Talking points. And just They're just talking points. Um, I, and I really don't want to be low. So uh, I'm just throwing out some numbers because um, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to get us into trouble and I don't want you to get into trouble on any dollar amounts. So I, I was trying to make sure they're a little higher and uh, it just depends on your area for retail. And then it depends on how the uh, system is designed for, for your cost on the, in size. Ah, uh, a little bit of survey coming back to us, John. Oh, excellent. Uh, you had asked about two seminars a week. I would likely not be able to accommodate that scheduling, and I believe that. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, and that's why we asked, you know, because I know I've got more than one webinar this week to do. I mean, not to train, but to, you know, sit through. So I definitely understand we're not the only company that's doing these webinars. So um, I kind of figured that's probably how it will go. Uh, and that's fine. I got no problem with that. And then once this whole COVID-19 thing goes, you know, we get everything under control, we'll have in-person trainings again, and we'll turn this this the solar training into a day or two-day training. Uh, so you can definitely come back and sit through it again. Uh, you know, we will offer in-person trainings, but uh, and we're going to keep doing webinars as well. So uh here's a question here's a good question um or frequently asked question will solar work if a customer currently has a generator for backup yes absolutely so the depending on the design um it it, it, it really depends on the utility again but we have hybrid inverters available to us and we have uh standard standard grid tied inverters available too what happens, and it really depends on how it's wired up, but likely when a when a solar inverter doesn't feel that pure sine wave um, from the grid, it sees the generator sine wave, uh, it shuts down. So uh, generators are very loopy and the grid is more consistent. So the solar will shut down in a situation if there's a generator running on site but you can wire that differently um, to prevent that, but that's not something we suggest. Now, uh, to expand upon that, there is hybrid inverters available, and we've recently uh, picked up a new vendor called SolarArc Inverters. They're a hybrid, and they allow for off-grid, they allow for on-grid, uh, what I find that I love about them is they allow us to have one inverter with a battery and solar. The real awesome part about them is, is they allow for a generator input. So you have one inverter that can be uh, charging a battery or discharging a battery um, with inputs of a generator to charge that battery and or solar to charge the same battery. So it, it basically adds redundancy 
of backup to a, a home to be able to last for days and days. Will batteries handle compressor startup loads? That is a great question and will have to be evaluated with every project. Um, variables, it's, it's just like the generator conversation. Um, definitely a, start, a soft start kit would be needed um, to cut the starting amps in half on that compressor. Um, but it would just, it would have to be evaluated um, and controlled or timed to where, um, well, we'd have to figure that out um, on that particular case, I guess. I mean, it just, it just depends on many factors on that, mm -hmm. but it can be done. Um, what is the energy output difference between black on black panel and the aluminum white panels? Well, I'll also throw one at you that I left you, uh, one that we're going to talk about next time, um, is another style called bifacial. Um, and so to answer your question, I guess, uh, bifacials are the, the next level and they are clear back sheet with cells on the backside so that we get reflective uh, energy from snow or the ground or whatever it may be. Um, so we have three levels. We don't just have two. So we have white back sheets, we have black back sheets, and we have clear. And the black back sheets are a little less efficient uh, just simply because they're black. Uh, anything, you know, just look at roofs. Anything that's black attracts more heat. If you have heat, you have energy loss. So the white back sheets produce a little less heat, which makes them a little bit more efficient. Um, I think I'm running out of questions, John. Oh, hang on. Um, Yeah, so our follow-up email will con uh, we'll make sure that we have all six uh, webinars titled in our follow-up email, and we'll have the dates and times on those. But the next one is solar design. We'll be also talking about uh, install on roof application, uh, pitched roof applications, uh, as well as flat roofs. So we'll talk about ground mount applications on how to design those. We'll talk about storage as another topic. Um, yeah. We want to make sure that we are providing good content and material for for you. And uh, so if you have any feedback, just sh please email us back. And if it needs to be shorter sessions, longer sessions, yeah. just once a week, on only on Wednesdays, any feedback you have for us is greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, get with us, your TM, any of us. Just let us know so we know how to kind of proceed going forward. All right. With, with that, um uh, we'll go ahead and end the session for today and uh please contact us if you have any questions thank you so much i uh, appreciate it and have a have a good safe week